Now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Knows. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into a time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. One of the earliest quiz shows that I know of is a program called True or False. Now, this show was very, very interesting in that it truly was audience participation. And you can tell uh, by you have the postal clerks against the League of Women Voters in this episode of the program. This goes back all the way to uh, September 12th. 1938, and uh, if my quick math memory uh, off the top of my head, I believe that's 85 years ago, but let me re-add that as we listen to this episode of True or False. True or False, silver is a better conductor of electricity than copper. Do you think that's true or false? At night, the starboard lights of a ship are green and the port lights red. How would you answer that? True or false? Buddhism is a much older religion than Christianity. And that one, is it true or false? Dr. Harry Hagen's True or False program comes to you tonight from Cincinnati. This program is presented each week by the makers of Williams Shaving Cream, the people who have been making fine shaving preparations for nearly 100 years. In addition to Williams Shaving Cream, they give us Glider, the new non-oily brushless shave, and Aqua Velva, the world's most popular after-shaving lotion. Now let me turn you over to the man you've been waiting to hear, your host and game leader, Dr. Harry Hagen. Thank you, thank you, and good evening, everyone. And hello to Cincinnati. You know, it's a real thrill to be out here with so many friends of True or False, and it looks as though Cincinnati is going to come through with another first-rate contest for us, because here is the lineup. For the men, we have six determined young postal clerks, gentlemen who earn their bread and butter in the employ of the post office in Cincinnati. And they look as though they're going to be pretty tough to beat, but that doesn't seem to worry the ladies who are opposing them, not in the least. These are six members of Cincinnati's League of Women Voters. And they're a pretty competent lot themselves. They're captained by Mrs. Edward Parsons, Executive Secretary of the organization. Mrs. Parsons, we'd like to hear something about your team and about the League of Women's Voters. Hello, Go ahead, recite it, please. <laughs> well, it's very nice to be here and to greet you on behalf of the League of Women Voters. I don't know just what to say about our team, except that we all think we're very hard working women. What is it? Might say something about the purpose of your League of Women Voters now in a few brief words. Well, our purpose of our league is to educate women to enter politics and and to be interested in government and to realize that government affects their lives just as closely as it does their husbands. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Parsons. Now I think a word from James Benvey, number one post office clerk, is in order. Captain Benvey, how do you feel about your chances tonight? Well, we took a true false contest to get our jobs, and we passed it with high averages, and I think we can master this one pretty well. <laughs> However, if we, if we go down, uh, the, the best team will win. Have no regrets. Uh, there is a saying, though, that uh, nothing can hold back the mail. Tonight, I'd like to add another word to that and say that nothing can hold back the mail clerks. Even the female. All right. <laughs> Thanks, James Bender. And now, let's hear from Gene Trace, our vice president in charge of prizes. Come in, Gene. Every one of the contestants on True or False tonight gets an attractive Williams gift kit, win or lose. But for the winning team, there's even more. A $5 bill goes to each member of that team. And the grand winner of the entire contest gets the grand prize of $25 in cash. And so on with True or False to see where the postal clerk our woman voter will be the last one standing. Mrs. Edward Parsons, here's tonight's first true or false. Poached eggs are sometimes fried. Is that true or is it false? It's false. Correct. They're always poached, broken and dropped into water. All right, Captain James R. Benvey. Jimmy, children often have to eat milk sops for dessert. Is that true or is it false? What's that? Children often have to eat milk sops 
for dessert. That's false. Sir. Correct. You know what a milk sop is? No, sir. You don't? Well, I've never heard of one. <laughs> never heard of one, the gentleman says. Well, Jimmy, I know you're not a milk sop because it's a slang term meaning a crybaby or a sissy. Well, I not... wouldn't even know anything about That's that. That's All right. Next on the list is Mrs. Morris Edwards. Mrs. Edwards, if you keep a colander, C-O-L-A-N-D-E-R, if you keep a colander on your desk, you never have to ask the date. True or false? False. You know what a colander is? Your answer is correct. A sieve. That's right. A colander is a strainer. A calendar should give the desired information. All right. This is just Mr. Graydon Gallagher. Uh, Gallagher? Uh, Graydon? And I'll call you Gallagher for short, I guess. Okay, okay. Wait for sparring for you. Now warm, my you, son? That's a little bit. Just better. a little bit. All right. Milk is an absolutely essential ingredient in soft custard. Is that true or is it false? That is true. Correct. Custard is a mixture of milk, eggs, and sugar, which is either boiled or baked. All right. So far, we're going along pretty well. Here's Mrs. Lowell Hobart, Jr. Mrs. Hobart, parmesium, P-A-R-A-M-E-C-I-U-M. Parmesium is an Italian cheese which is usually grated and sprinkled over spaghetti. Is that true or is it false? True. Oh, I'm sorry. That's false. That's parmesan. A parmesium is a tiny animal. Well, that's one down for the Women's League of Voters, and that brings up to the fellow here, James R. Dabrowski. Dabrowski. Beg pardon? Dabrowski. Oh, Dabrowski. Oh, you are the Dabrowski. Right. <laughs> well, Jimmy, I'll call you Jimmy. Don't right. mind that. Jimmy, do you think a man should be boss in his own home? Absolutely. I know one thing. I'm the boss in my home. Good boy. <laughs> well, 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 well. That's good boy. <laughs> Anyone that... Anyone that isn't boss in their own home should wear a petticoat. Is that so? That's right. Any man that isn't boss in his own home should wear, should wear a petticoat, did you say? Absolutely. Oh, boy. Well, how long have you been married? Uh, ten days. Ten days. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Jimmy, you have, you have lots to learn. Let me tell you that. I hope I'm not yeah, locked then... out tonight when I get there. What would you say, Jimmy? I hope I'm not locked out tonight. Hope you're not locked out. <laughs> well, what do you care? You're still the boss. <laughs> well, Jimmy, is it true or false? Turkish coffee is thicker than American coffee. Turkish coffee is thicker than American coffee. That is true. Correct. It's both thicker and sweeter than ours. All right. Now we have Mrs. Earl Galbraith. Mrs. Galbraith, white eggs have higher food value than brown eggs. Is that true or is it false? It's false. Correct. There's absolutely no difference between them and food value. Carl Braidbender. Is that right, Carl? That's right. Carl, Wiener Schnitzel is a popular French dish. Is that true or is it false? False. It's what kind of a dish? German dish. German dish. That's it. Say, listen, Carl. <laughs> Would you say your husband was, well, was irresponsible because he forgot his wedding anniversary? Up the microphone. Well, I don't know. I've got a solution for that, I think. Tonight happens to be my birthday, and if you get married on your birthday, you can hardly forget both dates. That's right. Is the girl listening in? Uh, she's here. She's here. <laughs> All right. Well, enough said for that. Mrs. Gilbert Bettman. Is that right, Miss Bettman? That's right. Mrs. Bettman, is it true or false? Egg yolks are used in making sponge cake. That's true. The yolks of eggs are a very important ingredient of good sponge cake. That's true. Now, Mrs. Uh, Bettman, do you think there will ever be a woman president of the United States? Why, absolutely. I don't know why not. We have a member of the cabinet. We have had a minister to Denmark. Mm -hmm. We have a federal judge. Yes, the woman have. couldn't make a worse job of it than the men do. Oh. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Anyway, here's Clem Volkerding. Is that right, Clem? That's correct. All right. Is it true or false? Boleros, B-O-L-E-R-O-S. Boleros are often worn in the spring. It's false. Oh, I'm sorry. It is true. They're short jackets with or without sleeves. That, I'm awfully sorry, Jen. All these girls have, well, quite a few girls have boleros on tonight. I see a couple of them in the radio audience. Well, score so far, we have five remaining for the women and five for the men. Then we have Mrs. William Hessler up before us. Mrs. Hessler, is it true or false that canopies, C-A-N-O-P-I-E-S, canopies are often served with cocktails? False. You know what a canopy is? Yes, it's a, an awning. An overhanging shelter of shade. Uh, canapes are often served with cocktails. They're spelled C-A-N-A-P-A-Y-S. Alois Ealing, is that right? That's right. Say, Alois, are you, are you married? No, I'm not. I, just, I thought I'd ask you first. The other fellow's married 10 days and he yeah. bought his own home. Well, why is it that they, people usually cry at weddings, you know, friends and relatives and so forth, you know? Well, they must be crying for someone, but 
What I like to know before I marry is who you're trying to. <laughs> who the marry? Well, I don't know. You got me there. Are you tempting, uh, contemplating marriage, always? No, I'm not. Not yet. Well, you eventually will. Won't you? Probably. Mm -hmm. All right. Now listen. Sliced bananas. I uh, beg your pardon. Sliced bandanas and cream make a very tempting breakfast dish. That's false. Well, <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Bandanas are large and usually bright colored handkerchiefs. It's often worn tied around the neck. That's right. Well, now we've completed one round. We have the score, five for the women and five for the men. We have Captain uh, Ed, Mrs. Edward Parsons before the microphone. Uh, Mrs. Parsons, is it true or false? The Battle of Manila Bay was a naval engagement of the Spanish-American War. True. Correct. Manila Bay was the scene of the victory of Admiral Dewey over the Spanish on May 1st, 1898. Captain James R. Bennett. Jimmy, do you think a husband should hand over his pay envelope to his wife every week? Well, I, I haven't had much experience, but uh, to start off with, yes. And uh, if things didn't go just right, why, well, I'd take things in my own hands. You take things? Well, what would you do then? Took things to say, take things in your own hands. What would your solution be? Well, I'd uh, just give her so much, and if she asked where the rest was, I'd say insurance or something was deducted. <laughs> Oh, the insurance. I see. In other words, the uh, the uh, deducts would get it. The deducts would have it. Deduct here, deduct there. I see. That's a good solution, by the way. All right, is it true or false? A rudder, R-U-D-D-E-R, -D -D -E is a young British sailor. It's false. Correct. A rudder is a device which directs the course of a vessel. Mrs. Morris Edwards. Mrs. Edwards, is it true or false? The Battle of Jutland, or Jutland, J-U-T-L-A-N-D, was a famous naval battle of the Spanish-American War. False. Correct. The Battle of Jutland was a naval engagement of the World War. Fought May 31st, 1916, between British and German fleets. Graydon Gallagher. Now I'm going to give you a special question that won't count the score, Graydon. Here it is. True or false? It's the thickness of the feathers that makes water roll off a duck's back. Won't count the score. What would you say to that? I didn't understand the question. It's the thickness of the feathers that makes water roll off a duck's back. False. False. Of course it is. The statement is false. It's the oil on the feathers that makes water roll off a duck's back. A duck has large oil glands in the skin that keeps its feathers covered with oil. And you know, you may be surprised to hear it's a lot the same way with a man's whiskers. And it's a point that's very important to remember when shaving. How about a gene trace? Is that true or is it false? That's true, Dr. Hagen. The sebaceous glands in a man's skin give out oil that gradually covers his whiskers. So in the morning, you can be sure there's a coating of oil on your beard that you've got to get rid of before you can make much headway in softening up your whiskers. You'll be glad to hear there's a shaving cream that removes this oily covering and saturates your beard with water. It's William's shaving cream. It makes a rich, heavy lather that has the power to melt away that oil on your whiskers. And this special Williams lather also holds an extra amount of water, so it very quickly soaks all the wiry stiffness out of your beard. You can shave fast and clean without scraping your skin. Begin right away to make your shaving easier this way. Get a tube of Williams shaving cream tomorrow. For economy's sake, get the double-sized tube. It gives you twice as many shaves and saves you more than 40% in cash. But make sure you get Williams. Williams Shaving Cream. Graydon Gallagher, are you married? No, not yet. We well, not. Well, when you do get married, do you think a wife should pick up after her husband, you know, socks, shoes, and so forth? Why, absolutely. You do? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Why do you think so? Well, I wouldn't want to agree with you. Well, uh, if a wife didn't pick it up, who's going to pick it up? I, that's right. That's right. All right there, Graydon, you'll find out. <laughs> Graydon, here's one we gave last week. A posthumous novel is one written after the death of the author. True or false? False. Correct. It's one published after the death of the author. Correct. Mrs. Earl Galbraith is next. Mrs. Galbraith, is it true or is it false? A halyard, H-A-L-Y-A-R-D, a halyard is a rope or wire used to hoist a sail. Yes. That's true. True. The is correct. James Dabowski is next. Jimmy, an ensign, E-N-S-I-G-N, is a flag flown on a ship. True or false? That is true. Correct. And Ensign is also a naval officer. Correct. Mrs. Bettman's next. Mrs. Bettman, in sailing, the log measures the speed at which a boat travels. Uh, true. Correct. The log is an instrument which measures the speed of a boat. It's also a day-by-day -day record of a voyage. Carl Braidbender's next. Carl, the crew's quarters are often in the forecastle. Is that true or false? Can I have that question over again, please? Yeah, the crew's quarters are often in the forecastle. Is that true or false? True. Correct. The fo forecastle or forecastle, some people say, is a compartment below the forward deck usually reserved for crew. Mrs. William Hessler, 
If you hear two bells on board an American ship, you may safely assume that it's either 12.30, 4.30, or 8.30 o'clock. Is that true? true? Oh, I'm sorry. That's false. You should know that it's either 1, 5, or 9 o'clock. Alois Ealing. Alois, is it true or false? At night, the starboard lights of a ship are green and the port lights red. That's true. That's correct. Captain Edward Parsons is next. Mrs. Parsons, the Europa is Germany's largest ship. Is that true or is it false? It's true. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's false. The Bremen is larger than the Europa. James Benny is next. J Jimmy, the flag of an admiral in the United States Navy consists of a blue background with three stars forming a triangle in the center. Is that true or is it false? It's false. Correct. That's a vice admiral's flag. The admiral's flag has four stars. <laughs> Mrs. Morris Edwards. Mrs. Edwards, the United States Naval Salute for Visiting Royalty is 18 guns. That's true. I'm sorry. It's 21 guns. 21 guns for Visiting Royalty. Graydon Gallagher, upon graduation from Annapolis, a midshipman assumes the rank of second lieutenant in the United States Navy. Is that true or is it false? I believe that is true. I'm sorry. No, it is false. He assumes the rank of ensign. Well, now the score. We have remaining for the women, too, and for the... Postal clerks, four. <laughs> Two and four. All right, next up here is Mrs. Galbraith. Mrs. Galbraith, is it true or is it false? The chief use of a regicide, R-E-G-I-C-I-D-E, -I -I -E, is to destroy insects. The chief use of a regicide is to destroy insects. False. Correct. You know what a regicide is? Yes. What is it? A person who killed. The That's king. right. A regicide is the murder of a king. An insecticide destroys the insect. <laughs> James Dubowski. Jimmy, plagiarism is a method for converting wood pulp into silk. That is false. Correct. You know what plagiarism is? I don't believe I do. Don't believe it, though. Well, <laughs> plagiarism means the stealing of someone else's ideas or artistic productions and using it as one's own. Mrs. Gilbert Bettman. Mrs. Bettman, the boll weevil is a machine of great importance to cotton growers. Is that true or is it false? That's false. Correct. The boll weevil is an insect which infests the cotton plant. Carl Braidbender. Carl, a sphere, S-P-H-E-R-E, -E, is a weapon with a long shaft and sharp head. False. Correct. That's a sphere. A sphere is a globe or ball. Well, score. Still four for the gentlemen and two for the ladies. Mrs. Galbraith, the solar plexus is a large sunspot. True or false? False. You know what a solar plexus is? Right here. Yes. <laughs> and she points right to the abdomen. Yes, that's right. The solar plexus is part of the human anatomy. A nervous center in the back of the abdomen. Alois Elling. Alois, sound travels faster in hot air than cold air. True or false? Sound, I have that again. Yes, yeah, sound travels faster in hot air than in cold air. That would be true. Correct. Right you are. Mrs. Bettman. <laughs> Mrs. Bettman, an asterisk. An asterisk is a small star which revolves around a planet. True or false? False. You know what an asterisk is? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, a star used in shape, to punctuation show mark. That's that. right. Often used to call attention to a footnote. Jimmy Bendry. <laughs> Jimmy. A square foot of gold always mo weighs more than a square foot of silver. A square foot of gold always weighs more than a square foot of silver. That's false. Correct. It all depends upon its thickness. Correct. <laughs> Mrs. Galbraith, the bubbling of carbonated water is caused by the release of carbon dioxide. True or false? It's true. Correct. Water dissolves more than its own volume of carbon dioxide in normal pressure. Place under normal pressure releases the excess gas. That's what causes bubbling. Jimmy Dabrowski. Jimmy, physiognomy is the branch of science which deals with body culture. True or false? That is true. I'm sorry. It is false. The physiognomy is the face. It's also the art of reading character from the features. Well, we have two women and three postal clerks left. Now, Mrs. Gilbert Bretman. The sun is a large planet. True or false? False. Correct. It's a star. Carl Braidbender is next. Carl, is it true or false? Marquisette is the name given to the wife of a Marquis. False. Correct. What was, what was Marquisette? I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> well, you'll find out. You'll find out. Marquisette is a material. A marchioness is the wife of a Marquis. All right, Mrs. Galbraith. Is it true or false? Charlotte Russe was a French woman who assassinated Murat. <laughs> false. 
Correct. <laughs> that was Charlotte Corday. Charlotte yeah. Russe is a dessert yeah, made of sponge cake, cake and cream. Very good, too. <laughs> Very fattening, too. <laughs> Alois Elling. Ealing, rather. Alois Robespierre was a French royalist. True or false? That's false. Correct. He was a French revolutionary leader who caused May to be guillotined. Mrs. Gilbert Bretman in the presidential election of 1916, Woodrow Wilson was a Republican candidate. True? False. Oh, correct. He was a victorious <laughs> Democratic candidate. <laughs> well, well, still, three for the men and two for the women. Who's going to win this contest tonight? I don't know. Maybe you can find out. James Benny, then V. George Washington was inaugurated president in 1783. True or false? George Washington was inaugurated president in 1783. That's false. Correct. He was inaugurated for the first time in 1789, the second time in 1793. Mrs. Galbraith, John Hancock, and Samuel Adams were Massachusetts patriots. True or false? True. Correct. Right you are. My, my. <laughs> Carl Bray Bender, Alexander Hamilton, and Thomas Jefferson were great political antagonists. True or false? False. Oh, I am sorry, it's true. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson was the leader of the Democratic Republican Party, which favored strong state power. Alexander Hamilton led the Federalist Party, which believed in strong federal power. Now, Mrs. Bettman has a special question to be off the record. True or false, hair grows faster at night than in the daytime, as on the face, I mean. <laughs> I'm sure I wouldn't know. <laughs> well, what would you say? I'd say true. Well, the statement's false. It doesn't count as false, so it's all right. <laughs> Authorities say that hair grows faster during the day than it does at night. That's why it's so important for a man to get a clean, close shave in the morning. Otherwise, he's apt to have a pretty dark chin by late afternoon. And now here are pointers on how to get a clean, close shave. Brought us by Gene Trace. First of all, a man should remember that when he gets up in the morning, his whiskers are comparatively waterproof. They're covered with a film of oil that tends to shut out water and keep the whiskers hard and stiff. So to make your beard soft and easy to shave off, you've got to remove that oily covering and then get water at your whiskers. Now, that's exactly what you do when you use Williams shaving cream. The rich, heavy Williams lather melts away that film of oil on your whiskers. And then, because it holds an extra amount of water, it soaks every bit of stiffness out of your beard. In a flash, your stubble is soft and limp. Then, it's a simple matter to get a fast, close shave without scraping or nicking your skin. You'll agree it's wonderful that using this Williams cream can make such a tremendous difference in your shaving. See for yourself soon. Get a tube of Williams shaving cream tomorrow. There are several different sizes, but bear in mind you get twice as many shaves at a 40% saving when you buy the big double-sized tube. The name to remember is Williams. Williams shaving cream. All right, Mrs. Batman. The score tonight, ladies and gentlemen, between the women's vo league voters of Cincinnati and the postal clerks of Cincinnati is tied. Two for the men and two for the women. And here is a chance now to ask Mrs. Bethman the question. Mrs. Bethman, polygamists are exempt from federal income taxes. True or false? <laughs> false. Correct. A polygamist is a man or woman married to more than one person at once. They pay taxes the same as you and I. Alois Ealing, Alois... The initials NLRB are the common abbreviation for the National Labor Relations Board. True or false? That's true. Correct. Mrs. Galbraith, Mrs. Galbraith, the Irish Free State is a member of the League of Nations. True or false? False. I'm sorry, it is true. It was admitted to the League in 1923. Now, Captain Benvey and you and your partner here, Alois Ealing, are appearing against this Mrs. Bettman. Now, it's your two men against one woman. So here it is. You ready for it? Yes, sir. All right. Poland is a kingdom. True or false? That's false. Correct. Poland is what? Republic. Right you are. <laughs> Mrs. Benton. Italy is a kingdom. True or false? True. Correct. Victor Emmanuel III is a king of Italy. Alois Ealing. Alois, Canada is a member of the League of Nations. Is that true or is it false? That's false. Oh, I am sorry. It is true. Well, once again, we're tied. Now, the first one to make a mistake on this... Tonight's broadcast means the other team wins. And the, the coincidental part of this thing is this. Either one of these people are entitled to $25 in cash besides winning the team prize. So, oh, be on your toes. Mrs. Bettman, if you earn less than $1,000 a year, you're exempt from federal income tax. True or false? True. Right you are. Captain James Benvey. <laughs> Jimmy, how do you feel? Well, I feel like I'm... Uh... 
and we'll, uh, we'll ask for the Moican to... Yes, sir. All right. Now, here. Acrimony, A-C-R-I-M-O-N-Y, is what a man pays his divorced wife. True or false? That's false. Correct. Right you are. <laughs> Mrs. Gilbert Bettman. Mrs. Bettman, 10 Downing Street is the address of the Bank of England. True or false? False. Correct. It's the official residence in London of the, prime, of the British Prime Minister. Jimmy Benveen. <laughs> Using the mails to defraud is a federal offense. True or false? That's true. That's correct. Right you are. Well, well, who's going to win this contest? Boy, is this really getting close. Mrs. Gilbert Bettman. Mrs. Bettman, penology is a science which, that treats with crime. Is that true or is it false? Penology is a science that treats with crime. I should say that were true. Correct. It's a science that treats with the punishment and prevention of crime. <laughs> James R. Benvey. Jimmy, the state is a prosecutor in a murder case. True or false? The state is a prosecutor in a murder case. That's true. Right you are. <laughs> Mrs. Bettman, the United States ambassador to France is William C. Bullitt. True or false? True. Right you are. Jimmy, if I sue you for libel, I'm the defendant. Is that true or is it false? If That's I sue false. You, correct. You're the defendant. I'm the plaintiff. All right. Well, well, well. In this United States, a national census is taken every 10 years. How about that, Mrs. Benson? That's true or false? True. Right, you are. Correct. Jimmy, in the United States Army, a major ranks higher than a colonel. In the United States Army, a major ranks higher than a colonel. True or false? That's true. Oh, I am sorry it's false. I'm sorry it's false, and that means the Women's League voters won tonight's contest. And the last question to win this contest tonight, given to Captain Jimmy Benvey, the true or false was, in the United States Army, a major ranks higher than a colonel. He says true. The answer is false. A colonel ranks higher than a major. I'll come up here, Mrs. Batman. On behalf of the William Shaving Cream people, I give you $25 for yourself. Oh, well, yes, sir. And thank just... you very much. And in... in behalf of the League of Women Voters, I accept it with great pleasure. Oh, just a minute. The pleasure's all mine. You can't do that. To... <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, whoa, don't go away. Here's $25 more to be divided among the five remaining women of your team. Thank you very, very much. Well, the League of Women Voters is delighted, and I'm sure will educate a great many voters with this additional money from well, the William Shaving Well, now, just a minute, just a minute. <laughs> if you can educate your husbands to use the William Shaving Cream, or educate all the Women's League of Voters all over the United States to use William Shaving Cream, I'm happy to give you the $50. <laughs> I assure you my husband needs no education in that Need line. no education. Well, don't you think the boys are pretty good? Come up here, Jimmy. Jimmy Benvey. I'm sorry I didn't win, Jim, but you're very, very good. Very, very good. Yes, sir, I think Jimmy needs a lot of applause. He's a fine, upstanding young man. He's going to go far in the Postal Service. Good luck and congratulations, Jimmy. Anything to say? Well, best team won. Best team. There you are. <laughs> uh, very good, Jimmy. You did a fine job. Now, next Monday evening, we'll find us back on our regular stamping grounds in New York City. At that time, we ought to have a good contest when six candid camera enthusiasts Tangled with a team of girls from the staff of the New Jersey College for Women. Boy, that ought to be good. And don't forget, you true or false fans in Baltimore, Maryland, we're going to bring true or false to your city early next month. So get busy making up your teams now, please. Here's Gene Trace to tell you what to do. To enter a team for true or false for the Baltimore contest or for a New York contest, here's all you do. Organize an interesting team of six people. List their names and occupations in a letter. And then, mail that letter to Dr. Harry Hagen in care of your station. That's all there is to it. Just send the list of your six team members to Dr. Harry Hagen in care of the station to which you're listening. And do that right away, you Baltimore true or false enthusiasts, because we're going to have a bang-up program down there. And now, to round off tonight's show, we'll have to give a true or false to Gene. As Gene Trace. Maybe we'll, we, we will remove all trace of Gene after this one. I don't know. So, Gene, here it is. See what you can do with it. Is it true or false that William Howard Taft succeeded Oliver Wendell Holmes as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court? Well, now, now, let me give it to you again. Right. I have no alibis. William Howard Taft succeeded Oliver Wendell Holmes as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Is that true or is it false? Let me see. Uh, Dr. Hagen, when was... Uh... William Howard Taft, president. I won't tell you. Because <laughs> if I told you, you'd know the answer. I'm not going to do it. Well, let me I see. I to commit myself. Is it true or false that 
William Howard Taft. All you have to do now, you don't be alibying. Is it true or is it false? <laughs> don't give me any stalling now. Come on, Gene. Well, I'm trying to get a hint from someone. Well, I'll say, uh, true, Dr. Hagen. Well, I'm not going to say whether you're right or you're wrong, but something tells me that question is going to come up again next week. So listen, and then you'll find out the answer. And now, believe me, Cincinnati friends, when I say we've had a swell time here tonight, I mean just that. And we had a swell contest. And I really hope we'll be back here again to see you all soon. And now let me say, as all good friends come to the parting of the ways, and for the makers of William Shaving Cream and myself, good night and good luck to you all. Thank you. This program came to you from Cincinnati through the National Broadcasting Company. Interesting how everybody knew the answers or had an idea of it. And that's one of the things where I go, gosh, maybe in the 1930s we were a more literate society than we are today. But there you go. True or false uh, here on Classic Radio Theater. Let's get to something theatrical here with an episode of The Great Gildersleeve. And we'll hear that in Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox continues following these messages. By the way, don't forget the anniversary special going on at My Pillow right now. Uh, their uh, lowest price in history on their My Pillows, queen size My Pillows, regularly sixty nine ninety eight, just nineteen ninety eight, ten dollars more for queen size. Uh, check out the clearance specials on My Pillow as well. MyPillow.com. Click on the radio podcast square. Uh, and use my promo code Wyatt, that's W-Y-A-T-T, Wyatt, and uh, find yourself something nice for you, for your pets. They got a lot of great products for your pet there as well. And the Roll and Go Pillows, my favorite, I use those in my recliner all the time. MyPillow.com, promo code Wyatt, best thing you you do for uh, a, a lot of what you got going on in your body now. Uh, back in 1943, everything was about the war. In this premiere episode of the 1943-44 season of The Great Gildersleeve, the big war bond drive is going on in Summerfield, and let's listen to Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> yeah. Kraft Cheese Company will also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night. Present each week at this time, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. Well, The Great Gildersleeve's vacation, like everyone else's, has come to an end, and our hero, full of new health and vigor, is about to take up once more the task of guarding, purifying, and distributing Summerfield's water supply. He's at breakfast now with Leroy and Marjorie, but as he crunches methodically on the sixth piece of toast... He looks and feels every cubic inch of him a water commissioner. My coffee, Unc? Well, since it's not rationed any longer, my dear, I suppose, as a patriotic duty, yes. My only regret is that I have but one cup to give for my country. That'll do, Leroy. The water commissioner's got to be on the alert in these war times, you know. Why? Well, water is one of the important sinews of war, young man. What kind of contribution could our citizens make to the war effort if there were no water to wash in? Yeah, wouldn't that be terrible? It, Leroy... I believe you enjoy being dirty. Do you consider that, that shirt clean enough to wear to school? Sure. Besides, it's the only one I've got. What about your face and hands? Are they clean? Oh, sure. Look at his ears. Who asked you? Never mind. Well, what did you have to butt in for? I didn't butt in. You did so. I did not. Quiet. <laughs> I'll not have the breakfast table made of bedlam with this infernal bickering. Is that clear, Leroy? Yes, sir. I hope it is. Now, Marjorie, don't you try to sound so virtuous. You're just as much to blame as Leroy, if not more so. You're old enough to know a little better. Tee-hee. Yeah. <laughs> Leroy, come here and let me inspect your ears. Ah, oh, gee, huh? Come here, young man. Oh, for corn's sake. They're perfectly clean, huh? I washed them till they hurt. When? The day before yesterday. Let me see them. Oh, you don't have to take them apart. Just as soon as you finished your breakfast. You go upstairs and wash your ears properly, young man. Tee-hee. Yeah, Marjorie... Your whole attitude has got to show a big improvement this year, or I'll be forced to take drastic steps. Gee, what kind of drastic steps? I don't know. Gosh. I've been thinking that possibly I should go and speak to your principal at school about you. Miss Goodwin? Huh? 
Well, I believe that's her name, unless it slipped my recollection. <laughs> oh, yes, good one is the name, or something like that. Are you kidding? Leroy, I do not care for that expression. Well, gosh, Unc, you went to call on her last week and came home holding hands with yourself. <laughs> you go wash your ears, young man. Okay, okay. And stick in your shirt tail. Okay, okay. Uh, that darn kid. You'd think from the way he talks that he was associated with bad companions. But what companions I see are angels alongside of him. Excuse me, Mr. Gilsey. No, no more toast, thank you, Bertie. I've enjoyed a plentiful sufficiency. You sure have, Mr. Gillsleeve. There ain't another slice of bread in this here house. Oh, well, you can't run a waterworks on nothing but water. (laughs) What is it you wanted, Bertie? I just found the morning paper under the hedge, and I noticed your name was in it. My name? Where? Where? Where is it, Bertie? Right here. Oh. Oh, here it is. Welcome home, Commissioner Gildersleeve. Well, that's very friendly of Mr. Powers. I must renew my subscription to his paper. What else does it say, Marjorie? Um... This morning, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve will return to his desk as water commissioner following what we trust has been a relaxing vacation. If it wouldn't be too much trouble, we hope he will shortly find time and energy to do something about the taste of Summerfield's water supply, which has deteriorated badly in the past few weeks. Why, uh, let me see that newspaper. Wait a minute, wait, there's more. The water now has reached the point where it has definite taste of onions, a condition which in our father's generation was attributed to the presence of water moccasins. Yep. Water moccasins? Why, that's libel. And then it just says, how about some action, Commissioner? By George, he'll get some action, all right. Where's my hat, Bertie? On the hall tree, Mr. Gilsey. Thank you. Well, I'm off. What you gonna do, Mr. Gilsey? Go out to the reservoir and look for water moccasins? No, I'm going downtown and look for a rattlesnake named Powers. Oh, come on, you're not gonna hurt him. Well, no, but I'll write him a letter he'll never dare to print. <laughs> Morning. Good morning, Mr. Commissioner. Morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Morning. Uh, good morning, Mayor. <laughs> uh, fine morning. Yes. Pleasant vacation, I hope. Oh, yes, yes. Very pleasant. <laughs> but glad to be back on the job. <laughs> uh, your secretary will tell you that I've called a little meeting in my office this morning, just the heads of departments. 9.30. Hope you can make it. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll be there. Good. See you then. Yeah. What does he want with me? Powers is back of this. Powers and his so-called newspaper. Well, by George, if there's anything wrong with that water, I'll, I'll drink it. No, I'm wearing it up now, Mabel. Still on the telephone. Well, I'm wearing it up now. I wore it down for a few days, but then I decided to look better up, so now I'm wearing it up. Of course, Herbie likes it down, but I've decided now I don't like Herbie. Bessie. I'll call you back, Mabel. Mr. Gildersleeve, you're back from your vacation. And you're right where I left you two weeks ago on the telephone. (laughs) I know. The service is terrible. I guess it's the war. I was saying only the other day that... Could I interrupt your analysis of the situation long enough to take a letter? Oh. Oh, yes. I'll just get my book. Letter to Mr. Frank Powers, editor of the Summerfield Indicator. Dear Mr... Where are you going? My, my book. I had it here somewhere. Oh, for goodness sake. Oh, I found it. It was right under the flower pot all the time. <laughs> Naturally. Let's see now. Where was I? Oh, it leaked on it. <laughs> Bessie, I'm trying to dictate a letter. Uh, I'm sorry. To the editor of the indicator. Dear sir. <laughs> now what? I have to sharpen a pencil. <laughs> Bessie, have you ever thought of going into war work? You'd make a wonderful bottleneck. (laughs) You just say that. (laughs) There. I'm ready now. Well, I'm not ready. I'm all out of the mood. Doggone it, now I gotta go back and get mad all over again. Uh, The water tastes bad, huh? Man says the water tastes bad. Oh, it tastes bad, does it? Bessie, bring me a glass of water. Yes, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yellow journal. Talk about leaving a bad taste in the mouth. Powers ought to read some of his own editorials. Here you are, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, paper cups now, huh? Mm -hmm, We got those while you were away. Well, we'll just see now. Uh. Uh. Do you like it, Mr. Gildersleeve? Bessie, you're my witness. I never tasted finer drinking water in my life. Cool, clear, and refreshing. That's what the man said. What man? The man who brings the bottles every week. Bottles? 
Bessie, what are you doing with bottled water in this office? Well, the tap water got to tasting kind of funny, so I had them put in a cooler. Get that thing out of here. Hello. Oh, uh, tell his honor. I'll be right down. Sorry to keep him waiting. Well, I guess I've got to face it. Bessie, get that water cooler out of sight. If anybody wants me, I'm going down to the mayor's office. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, yes, Bessie, what is it? I just remembered there was some message I was to give you when you came in. Let's see now, what was it? Bessie, I'm in a hurry. Oh, yes, the mayor called. He wants you to come down to his office. That Bessie, I'm going to have to let her go. Gildersleeve, you know all these gentlemen, I believe. Judge Hooker. Oh, sure. Hello, Gildy. Mr. Halloran, Mr. Peel. Uh, ah, and here's Mr. Powers. Now we can proceed. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Well, Gildersleeve, we had a little notice about you in our editorial column this morning. I saw it. No hard feelings, I hope. If you'd like to know my feelings, just step outside with me for a moment. All right, all right. Let's get down to business now, gentlemen. Just be sure you don't make any charges you can't prove, Powers. That's all. There's such a thing as libel, you know. Yes, and there's such a thing as freedom of the press. Come, come, gentlemen, we have important business. I brought you all together here to discuss something that reflects serious disgrace upon the town of Summerfield. Mr. Mayor, if you're referring to the water department... Nobody's talking about the water department. I'm talking about the third war loan drive and Summerfield's part in it. Frankly, our showing so far is way below what it should be. I think there's a reason for that. The reason is that we're all lying down on the job. Speak for yourself, Powers. No, I think the reason is we're not properly organized. We've got to figure out where the money is and go after it. Now, the first national of Summerfield. Does anybody know how much they bought? Oh, you're all wet there, Judge. It isn't the banks. They're only a drop in the bucket. It's the people who've got the money. It's the $25 and the $50 bonds that add up. All right, how are you going to sell them? You know so much. How would you go about it? Well, you all know what they're doing over in Riverton. They've pledged themselves to sell enough bonds to build a gunboat, the USS Riverton. And they've already gone halfway to their quota. It's working over there. That's why the indicator started this campaign to get Summerfield to build the USS Summerfield. Which is nothing but a publicity stunt for the indicator, and you know it. Oh, now, Mr. Gildersleeve, I think you owe Mr. Powers an apology. Powers owes me an apology. I suggest we forget our personal differences and get on with the bond drive. <laughs> The way it's been going so far, the USS Summerfield is going to turn out to be a rowboat. Well, I refuse to believe that Summerfield is any less patriotic than Riverton. How about it, gentlemen? Are we going to take this lying down? No, by golly. No. Certainly not. That's what I say, Gildy. Then let's pitch in. I'm at your service, Mr. Mayor. That's the spirit I like to see in my commissioner's Gildersleeve. Now, I've appointed Powers here as chairman in charge of the whole drive. What? And I'm asking each of you to serve under him as sub-chairman. He'll assign the territories you're to cover and so forth. Uh, anything you'd like to add, Mr. Powers? No, except to say that we're really going to try from now on to make this an all-out drive. We're asking all businesses, as well as the schools, to close at noon, beginning today. I've already sent out instructions to that effect. So that everybody can get out and sell bonds, and that means everybody. You hear that, gentlemen? Everybody. And tomorrow night, there'll be a rally in which you'll all be expected to take part. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Gildersleeve. I think I may say that I'm as good an American as anybody here. But nobody questions that, Mr. Gildersleeve. I've always done my part, and I'll continue to do so. I'll go out in the street and sell bonds. But I must decline to serve on any committee or appear on any platform with the Honorable Chairman. Guilty! Until he withdraws certain false and malicious charges made about me this morning in the public prints. Good day, gentlemen. Who's that? Who's that? Uh, just me. Hello, Marjorie. Well, what are you doing home at this time of day, Unky? Office is closed. I'm going to go out and sell bonds door to door. Oh, you poor darling. On such a hot day, too. Well, it's got to be done, my dear. There's no use spoiling my lunch over it. No, of course not. There's some mail for you. That'll spoil my lunch for sure. Here you are. Ugh, bills and circulars. There's no time of the month to be sending out bills or circulars either. If I didn't... Oh, what's this? Well, yes, uh, <laughs> 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 what do you know about that? Sounded pretty good from here. What is it? Oh, nothing really. Uh, only uh, gratitude is such an unusual thing that, well, well, I'll read it to you. It's from that Miss Goodwin, 
Leroy's principal. Oh. No, no, nothing like that. No. Just a nice letter, my dear. Yes. Yes. Uh, dear Mr. Gildersleeve, I've just learned the true motive behind your call on me last week. You need not have gone to such pains to spare my feelings. A progressive teacher soon learns to expect opposition from some of the parents. But it's seldom she has the good fortune to have one of them rise so generously to her defense as you did. I'm very grateful, believe me, and hope soon to have a chance to thank you in some more personal way. Sincerely yours. Isn't that nice? Sure, but I don't get it. Well, some busybodies objected to her being put in as principal. Oh. They delegated me to take steps. But as soon as I called on her, I could see at a glance she was a fine educator. So I told her to pay no attention to them. Oh. You know, I think I ought to go over and see her this afternoon. Thank her for this note. Don't you think so? Gosh, no. Why should you? Well, uh, gratitude is such a rare thing, my dear. It should be encouraged. But, Unc, I thought you were going to sell bonds. Bonds? Oh. Well, this is right on the way to my territory. <laughs> Bet you never make it. Yeah. I have to run now. Goodbye, dear, and be careful. Yeah, don't worry about your old uncle. <laughs> I'll see you at supper. <laughs> Uh, let's see now. What did she say? I'm very grateful, believe me, and hope soon to have a chance to thank you in some more personal way. <laughs> well, I think I'll give that lady a chance to make good on that promise. <laughs> School's closed. She ought to be home. <clears throat> Why, Mr. Gildersleeve, what a pleasant surprise. Come in. Thank you. I uh, got your note, Miss Goodwin, and I... Uh, well, I thought I'd drop around. <laughs> oh, well, when I heard what you'd done, I simply had to write to you. Oh, it was really nothing. Anyone interested in education would have done the same thing. <laughs> oh, well, I don't believe that. I think you were very brave and wonderful to do it. You do? Well, I think you're a very wonderful uh, grammar school principal. <laughs> oh, thank you. No, I mean that. I, I was going to come and see you anyway. I wanted to talk to you about my uh, nephew. Yes, he's in your school. Oh, well, I'll be glad to help in any way I can. Come in and sit down, won't you? Well, I can't stay very long. <laughs> no, not very long. i got to sell some bonds this afternoon. Well, well, that's all this, eh? An art exhibition? Oh, no. No, those are posters the children at school have done for the bond drive. They're going to distribute them all over town this afternoon. Oh, very clever work. Oh, are, are you interested in painting? Am I? I've got every art volume ever put out by the Book of the Month Club. Oh, really? Well, then you'll appreciate this poster here. I, I think it's got some of the feeling of Grant Wood. Oh, yes, I can see what you mean. Remarkable uh, chiaroscuro, too, for a child, don't you think so? Oh, yes, yes. Remarkable uh, chiaroscuro, yes. <laughs> Here's one that's quite futuristic. The child told me these were supposed to be airplanes. These? Yes. Very poor, in my opinion. No wing flaps. Oh, my. You certainly are refreshing, Mr. Gildersleeve. Refreshing? Mm-hmm. Most men are afraid of painting. They think of it as art with a capital A. They're afraid to have an opinion one way or another. That's not my way, Miss Goodwin. Why, if Rembrandt himself was to walk in here and ask me what I thought of his painting, I'd tell him straight from the shoulder. <laughs> Rembrandt is wonderful, isn't he? Yeah, and that's what I'd tell him. <laughs> <laughs> have, um, have you ever tried to paint, Mr. Gildersleeve? Paint? No, not really. I used to sketch a bit in my younger days. Well, why didn't you keep on with it? You might have become a great painter. No, I don't think so. I can never get the nose in the right place. <laughs> but you know something? If I could paint, I'll bet you'd make a wonderful model. Oh, oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, you, you don't mean that. Oh, yes, I do, Miss Goodwin. You've got the uh, chiaroscuro. <laughs> and you got plenty of it, too. <laughs> well, Mr. Gildersleeve, I, I think we'd better talk about your nephew. Oh, he can wait. Someday when we have lots of time. Well, uh... Let's sit down, shall we, if we can find a place? Everything's awfully messy with all these posters. Well, uh, the sofa's all empty. Yes, well, uh, you take that. I'll sit here in the little rocker. Oh, not very sociable. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Well, hello. Well, Unc, for Pete's sake. Leroy. Aha! Uh -huh. I'm helping Miss Goodwin. Uh, so this is your nephew, Mr. Gildersleeve. He's one of our best little workers. He's a spy at heart. 
I'm not spying, Unc. I just came here to get some posters to take around to the stores. Didn't I, Miss Goodwin? Oh, trying to get in right with the principal, eh? Well, what are you doing? <laughs> I'll see you later, young man. Goodbye, Miss Goodwin. And Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> Oh, hello, PV. Now, be right with you. Just finishing up a prescription here. How are you, Mr. Gildersleeve? PV, I'm tired. I thought I'd just, just drop in for a moment and rest my bones, if you don't mind. Yeah, not at all. Sit down there at the counter. Uh, up a little late last night? No, no, just tired. It's just bond drive. House to house stuff, you know. Very wearing. No, you've been out soliciting. Yeah, that's it. I haven't actually started yet, but I get tired just thinking about it. Hmm. I know how it is. Whenever I hear they're starting a new drive, I lay in a good stock of footies. Say, uh, you wouldn't want to buy a bond, would you, Peavy? Well, I'll tell you. That's all right. This isn't my territory anyway. I just thought I might sell one while I'm sitting here. Well, I'd like to give you my trade, Mr. Gillespie, but the fact is you're a little late. Your nephew, Leroy, was in here and signed me up at the crack of dawn. That kid is everywhere. You know something, Peavy? Maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm getting tired of this war. I'm getting tired of hearing about it. Well, I guess we all are, but... I'm getting it. tired of a lot of things. Getting tired of these energetic women. Always doing things. Always winning the war and making posters. That's not what women are for. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I mean it. I like a woman who's a little old-fashioned. I like a woman who isn't too busy to, well, be charming. You know. <laughs> I like a woman who's feminine. I like a woman who... You just like women. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it happens you're wrong, Peavy. I'm a one-woman man. Well, maybe you are at that. Tell me, do you uh, ever hear from her? From who? Mrs. Ransom. When is she coming back? Who said anything about Mrs. Ransom? Well, I'm sorry. My mistake. Yeah. You're barking up the wrong tree, Peavy. That's all over and done with. Yep. That chapter in my life is a closed book. But I might just go back and take a peek. Hi, Unc. Leroy, are you following me? What are you doing here? I brought Mr. Peavy a poster for his window. What are you doing here? I thought you were going to go out and sell buns. What I do is my affair, young man. I'll tell teacher. Yeah. All right, all right, I'm going, Legree. Oh, uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, will we see you at the rally tomorrow night? No, Peavy, you will not see me at any rally conducted by Mr. Powers. I'll win this war my own way. <laughs> Of this great state and of this great municipality of Summerfield. Yes, I say to you, my friends, I say to you, civilization today is looking to us. Not to you, not to me, but to all of us. Are we going to fail it in this, its hour of need? What is the answer? You better wind it up, Judge. They're going to sleep on you out there. I'll tell you the answer. The answer is no. A thousand times no. Not once. Not twice. Not three times. Not four times. But a thousand times no. You'll never wake him up that way, Judge. In the words of that great statesman and scholar, whose fame will live forever enshrined in the hearts of his fellow countrymen, but whose name at the moment escapes me. <laughs> For Pete's sake, huh? Well, you give somebody else a chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, as the horse thief remarked when they hung the fatal noose around his neck, I see my time is short. <laughs> Before I close, I would just like to leave with you one thought. Buy war bonds. Buy all you can. Not one bond. <laughs> Not two bonds. <laughs> Not three bonds. Uh, thank you, Judge Horace Hooker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge. Yeah. I know we're all going to profit by what the judges had to say here tonight. Say, Frank. Huh? What is it, Judge? Look who just came in. Gildersleeve. 
Well, what do you know? Why, the old sorehead. I thought he wasn't coming. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please. Uh, this wasn't exactly on the program, but uh, I'd like to call on somebody now. Somebody you all know. Summerfield's popular water commissioner, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Uh, would you say a few words, Gildy, please? Yeah, come on, Gildy, come on. That's the way. Uh, make way for him there, folks. Get over uh, Make way for the commissioner, that's it. Uh, help him up on the platform, somebody, please. Wait a minute. I'll give him a hand. A uh, couple of you fellas down front there. Get behind him and booze. Come on. Now, wait a minute, Gildy. We need a couple of more volunteers here. That's it. Uh, thank you, sir. All together now. Heave. Steady, steady. Up, steady, it. Uh, Thank you, thank you I just want to say, folks, that uh, Gildersleeve and I have had our little differences from time to time We had one this week when my paper cast doubt on the flavor of Summerfield's water supply Of which the commissioner is justly proud We said it tasted bad Since then, I've been informed that this is a temporary condition Caused by natural phenomena beyond the control of any man And the water is already, if possible, more delicious than ever. Uh, Will that be a sufficient retraction, Commissioner? Or do you want me to print it in the indicator? There's more people here than read the indicator. I'm satisfied. (laughs) (laughs) All right, then, Gildy. Go ahead. The floor is yours. And I hope it'll hold you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, folks, I don't know what I'm doing up here. I'm certainly not going to make a speech. I haven't got one written, and if I had, I'd tear it up. I, I just want to tell you about something that happened to me yesterday. If it makes you feel the way it made me feel, we won't need any speeches, any of us. I suppose everybody here at this rally has been out canvassing this week. I got around to my district yesterday afternoon. A little late, but at least I got around to it. And I'll admit I was feeling pretty darn patriotic about it, too, giving my valuable time that way. I marched up to the first house, and I knocked on the door. Pretty soon it opened. It was a woman. I said, how do you do? You're the lady of the house, I presume? Yes. Mrs. uh, Kirk, is it? Yes, that's right. Well, Mrs. Kirk, I'm Mr. Gillisleeve. I'm calling in connection with... Oh, excuse me, please. I've got something on the stove. I'm afraid it's boiling over. Come in, won't you? I'll be right back. Oh. So I stepped inside. She had a very small place there. Couldn't have been more than three or four rooms. There was a child playing on the floor in the living room. A little shaver about two, I guess. I said to him, Hello there. What's your name? I had a little conversation with him. (laughs) Nice little boy. Presently, the woman came back from the kitchen. Well, I'm so sorry. Not at all. I was just talking with your son here. Fine lad. Oh, goodness. That's my grandson. Oh, (laughs) well, it's hard to believe. Such a young grandmother. Uh, uh, Mrs. Kirk... I'm here in connection with a war bond drive. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve... Yes, I know. You've bought bonds. We all have. Personally, I've been investing all I can spare regularly. But are we doing enough? Are we doing all we can? Well, I try. You see, I'm... I know, I know. We all try. That is, we think we do. We put up with our little inconveniences, rationing and so on. We buy a bond now and then when the spirit moves us. But do we make any real sacrifices? Just ask yourself, Mrs. Kirk... Do you ever think of the boys at the front and what they're going through? Yes, I do. I think of it day and night because my boy's one of them. Oh. I try to do what I can, but it's a little difficult. You see, my daughter-in-law lives with me now. She works and I take care of Bobby while she's away all day. No, Bobby, dear, take that out of your mouth, Adam. Of course, we have Robert's allotment every month, but that still isn't very much to go around. Mrs. Kirk, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have come barging in here like this, telling you what you ought to do. Oh, no, now, you mustn't feel that way. Excuse me. Uh, Bobby, darling, why don't you run outside and play? That's a good boy. Run along. Uh, Cute little fellow, isn't he? Perfect image of his father. I remember when he was just that age. Well, I guess I'll... No, no, please don't go. I, I want you to understand. We want to buy bonds. I'm glad when I can buy a bond, because every time I do, I think, this is for Robert. And I think maybe it'll help to protect him and bring him back safe. It's just that 
Well, maybe we don't manage very well. Oh, I think you manage wonderfully. No, I never did have much of a head for figures, but... You're a man. Perhaps if you didn't mind, you could look at our budget and show me how we could do more. Well, Mrs. Kirk, I'm no shining example myself when it comes to that. Well, maybe not, but you're a man, and men understand about those things. It'd only take a minute if you don't mind. Well, no, only... Gosh, I'd hate to have anybody look at my budget. Well, we want to do all we can. Well, she brought out her budget and made me go over it. And when I saw how little she had to live on, I don't remember all the figures, but there was $35 for rent, $50 or so for groceries, the usual amounts for gas, light, and so on, practically nothing for clothes and such. But every month, about 25% of her income was going into war bonds. I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I was so darn ashamed of myself, I got out of there as fast as I could. I didn't try to sell any more bonds that day. I went home and really dug down myself. And if everybody else in this town will do the same, we won't need any more rallies. And there won't be any question about the USS Summerfield. We'll show Riverton we can build a gunboat just as big as theirs and bigger. (laughs) Why... We'll build one big enough to sink theirs. Hey, wait a minute, Gildy. Huh? Summerfield and Riverton are on the same side in this war. Oh, yes, I forgot. Gildersleeve program this week was contributed to the Treasury's third war loan drive by the Kraft Cheese Company. Music was under the direction of Claude Sweet. This is Ken Carpenter inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. September 12th, 1943, The Great Gildersleeve. I'm Wyatt Cox. This is Classic Radio Theater, moving the microphone around, which I'm not supposed to do. Of course, The Great Gildersleeve, a spinoff of Fibber, McGee, and Molly. And let's listen in just a moment to an episode of Fibber, McGee, and Molly from uh, one of their quarter-hour series going back to September 12th, 1954, and that's up in just a moment. Thanks for joining me. I'm Wyatt Cox. This is Classic Radio Theater. Now, an episode of Fibber McGee and Molly, one of what they like to call the lost episodes. This goes back to uh, September 12th, 1954. It's time for Fibber McGee and Molly. Sundays through Thursdays, NBC brings you Fibber, McGee, and Molly transcribed. The show is written by Phil Leslie and Ralph Goodman and directed by Max Hutto. Fibber and Molly will be with you in a minute. Within the next 20 seconds, almost before I can complete this sentence, a fire will break out somewhere in the United States. They add up each year to about 11,000 lives lost and property damage in the millions. And the unfortunate part of this picture is that most of these fires could have been prevented. For example, 90% of all fires which start in the home can be traced to human carelessness. Someone drops off to sleep while smoking a cigarette in bed. A householder allows old newspapers, magazines, and other inflammable debris to pile up in attics or garage. Defective electric wiring is ignored until too late. A housewife forgets the rules of safety and uses a combustible cleaning fluid. These are the principal causes of fires within the home. If you're guilty of any one of them, you're inviting disaster. And don't be guilty of careless thinking. Don't think it couldn't happen to you and to your home. Just remember, it doesn't pay to gamble with fire. The odds are against you every time. Did you lock the car, McGee? Mm, yeah. How do I look? Do I look okay? You look 
Fine dairy. Doc said he'd meet us at Wong's, didn't he? Wong's restaurant. That's where he said he'd meet us. Of course. You made the date with him. Said he'd meet us at Wong's after we eat and ride out to the country club in your car. You're going to drop me at home. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's how it is, isn't it? Say, you're awful jumpy tonight. What's the matter with you? I don't know. I, I just got a premonition or something. Look, when Doc comes, let, let's tell him I can't make it. Can't make it? Uh, I just don't feel like going to his country club smoker with him tonight. If you could come along, it'd be different. Oh, you... now listen. You'll have a wonderful time. My goodness, you were so enthused about it. You've been trying to get Dr. Gamble to introduce you to those influential friends of his for months. And... I know, but well, well, tonight just ain't the night. Uh, I'm just not my usual self tonight. You know, charming and witty. The type of guy that he can swap a good story with anybody like I do when I'm feeling sort of John Cameron Swayze-ish, which I just don't feel tonight. Well, maybe a good chop suey dinner will put that Swayze feeling back. I don't know. Come on, open the door for me. You're probably just hungry. Oh, Mr. McGee, welcome to Wong's Chop Suey Pagoda. Hi. Uh, so nice to see you and your charming wife. Uh, you like nice table by window? Yeah, yeah, that'll be okay. Oh, this way, please. Oh, I'm a Yankee doodle dandy, Yankee doodle do or die. You sit down, please. My, you sound happy tonight, Mr. Wong. Uh, yes, Wong, very happy. Got the citizenship paper today. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, Wong, 100% American. Uh, can complain about everything just like Mr. McGee do. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, did you hear that, McGee? Yeah, uh, look, Wong, we're supposed to meet Doc Gamble here. So when he shows up, bring him over to our table, will you? You know Dr. Gamble, don't you? Oh, sure, sure. Not necessary to describe a Dr. Gamble. Soon as uh, three people walk in wearing one blue serge suit, that him. <laughs> <laughs> three people. <laughs> one blue serge suit. Did you hear that, dearie? That's the best description. <clears throat> you better bring the menu, Mr. Wong. Mr. McGee is hungry. More tea, dearie? No, thanks. Wong sure makes good chop suey, don't he? I told you you were just hungry. You feel a lot better now, don't you? Mm hmm About going to that country club thing with Dr. Gamble? No, I, I thought I felt better, but I don't. Doggone it, I just know if I went to that thing with Doc, I'll wish I hadn't went. I'll make a bad impression. I'll insult somebody. I'll make a dunce of myself some way. I feel it. Oh, for heaven's sake. You certainly have a low opinion of yourself tonight. Where's that old McGee spark? Well, you know how it is, Molly. Some nights you got it and some nights you haven't. And tonight, I haven't got it. Well, what did you do with it? You certainly were full of it when we were at Mabel's the other night, when you put that silly lampshade on your head and yelled, flip my switch, mother, and call me Mazda. Your son is in the shade. Well, that was one of the nights when I had it. Well, if that's what you do when you've got it, it's just as well you lost it. Now, come on, have a rice cake, and I'll pour you some more tea. Okay, but... And let's forget all this foolishness. You're going to that country club thing with Dr. Gamble tonight and be your own sweet self, and they'll love you. Well, I hope you're right. I've had this strange feeling, though, all evening. Call it inhibition, if you like. You call it inhibition. I'll call it just plain foolishness of all the silly... Oh, my gosh. What's the matter? This rice cake I just opened. Do you know what it says inside on my fortune? What? McKee, where are you going? Come on, let's get out of here. Let's not wait for Doc Gamble. I knew this feeling I've had all evening meant something, and this fortune proves McGee, it. McGee, sit down here. Come on now, sit down. Well, gee whiz. Wait till you read this fortune. Here, read it. You'll see. You have a rendezvous with a big man in a blue serge suit. <sighs> Beware. He will bring you trouble. What? That's it. I'm not going anywhere with Doc Gamble tonight. No, sir. I knew something oh, was Oh, this is just silly. Who makes up these crazy fortunes anyway? Mr. Wong? Oh, Mr. Wong, will you tell us... There's more fun with the McGee's shortly. Had no time for music when you were young? Well, now's the time to improve yourself with an exciting new shortcut to great music. The new RCA Victor Listener's Digest. Here in this one low-priced package, you get these three big values. Value number one is 12 of the world's best-loved compositions in digest form on 10 RCA Victor 45 High Fidelity Records. They're performed by the world's greatest artists. In complete album form, this collection would cost you almost $60. Value number two is RCA Victor's famous automatic Victrola 45 phonograph. Value number three, a wonderful 42-page musical guide. Fascinating stories about the composers and their music. 
Now all this can be yours for as little as $39.95. See and hear the new RCA Victor Listener's Digest at your dealers now. Remember the world's best names for quality. RCA and RCA Victor. And you say you put these fortunes in the rice cakes yourself, Mr. Wong. Oh, yes, Mr. McGee. We make all our own rice cake last week, and Wong make a fortune himself. You like? Yeah, loved it. Don't you see how silly you are, McGee? You certainly don't think Mr. Wong knew you had a date with Dr. Gamble when he made up this fortune a week ago, do you? Well, just the same, I'm well, not... Excuse me, Mr. McGee. Do fortune say that? Not exactly, Mr. Wong. It says, you have a rendezvous with a big man in a blue serge suit. Beware, he will bring you trouble. I'm supposed to meet Doc Gamble. Oh, Dr. Gamble, big man, blue shirt suit. Oh, very good, Wong, very good. Excuse, please. Hey, what are you doing? Every time Wong Fortune Rice Cake come true, Wong Ring Gong, cashier mark down, keep score. Really? Does this happen often? Oh, very often. Wong read Fortune very good. Had one right in 1939, <laughs> two in 1950, and now another correct. Only four years away. Oh, my daughter say Wong, regular Chinese Dunninger. <laughs> well, that's good enough for me. I'm not going near Doc Gamble tonight. Pick it up the check, Wong. We're leaving. Sure thing. I bring check right away. Oh, for heaven's sake. Let's at least wait and explain things to Dr. Gamble, if that's possible. You know, he went to a lot of trouble to get you invited out yeah, there. Yeah, I know. But well, what am I going to say to Doc? My rice cake said beware? How's that going to sound? Now you see how ridiculous this whole thing is. Here, I'll prove it to you. You and your rice cake. What are you doing? Opening mine. There. Well, what does it say? Well? Never mind. But this whole thing is just silly. Let me see that fortune. It's nothing. Don't grab things like that. Give me that back, I McGee. I just want to read it. Let's see. Tonight is the night of the dragon. Beware the man in the blue suit. Trouble lies ahead. Aha! Uh -huh. Oh, it's probably just a set. That's silly, Mr. Wong. He probably makes these up in pairs. I and... don't care how he makes them up, Molly. I'm getting out of here. This thing is eerie. Where's Wong with our check? Where is he? You know, it certainly is a strange coincidence. Mm -hmm. Both of those fortunes reading the same way is sort of... Well, I mean, I'm beginning to feel like you do. If you feel like I do, you got goosebumps all over you. When Doc Gamble waddles in that front door in that baggy blue surge of his, I'm not going to be here. Hey, Wong, the check. Take it easy, flap lip. We got lots of time. Dr. Gamble. Hiya, Molly. Hiya, Noisy. <clears throat> well, say something, kids. Surprised, huh? <laughs> How you like it? My gosh, a new suit. Gray flannel. A beautiful gray flannel. Prettiest gray flannel suit I ever saw. Not a touch of blue surge in that gray flannel anywhere. Oh, Doc, you look just beautiful. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Gee, thanks, kids. Uh, Miss Cuddleton helped me pick it out. She says I've been wearing blue surge long enough. I recheck, Miss McGee. Two chop suey dinner. And... Oh, Dr. Gamble. No blue suit. Hello, Wang. Oh, this is most unfortunate. Hmm? Very disappointing. Already ring gong for fortune come true, now big flop. You said it, big man in blue suit, beware. Ha! Come on, give me the check, Dunninger. How much? Two chop suey dinner, six egg roll, barbecue yeah. shrimp, $3.60. Here you are, you keep the change. Well, come on, kids, let's get going. Good night, Wong. Good night, Mr. Wong. Good night, Doctor, Mr. Missy McGee. Oh, tonight is night of dragon. Very bad night for telling fortune. You can say that again. Boy, I'm sure glad to see you, Docky, old man. You don't know what a lift it gave me tonight to see you walk in that door in your new suit, your gray suit. Well, I hope I make as good an impression at the club. I think you'll enjoy this tonight, McGee. Been looking forward to it all day, Docky, Oh, indeed boy. he has. It's all he's talked about. You boys will drop me at the house. Betcha. You. you got the car keys? Never mind, I got them. Ah, uh, this ought to be a swell evening on account of... Because... I beg your pardon, sir. Huh? You talking to me, officer? Uh, yes. Is this your car? Yeah, that's our car. Uh, good. I've been waiting for you to come along. Oh, yeah? Uh, what's your problem, bud? There's no parking limit here, is there? No, there isn't. Not on Sunday. Well, maybe if I take my foot down and step aside, you'll get the idea. Heavenly days of fire plug. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. Didn't you notice that when you parked, Molly? You were the one who was driving, McGee. I was busy powdering my nose. Well, you folks may have overlooked it, but we notice little things like fire plugs. That's the first thing they teach us in basic training. We boys in blue are taught that the first thing to look for... Boys in blue? 
Oh, my goodness, that's right. McGee, that suit he's wearing, it's blue. Holy smoke, that's right, blue serge. Well, now that you're through admiring my uniform, may I see your driver's license, sir? Show it to him, dearie. I'll be right back. Hey, where are you going, Molly? Back to Wong's to kick the gong. It looks like he just hit the jackpot. <laughs> We'll say goodnight to Fibber and Molly in a moment. Tomorrow evening here on NBC, there's a pair of fine musical features. The Hollywood Bowl Concert and the Telephone Hour to help make your evening more enjoyable. The Hollywood Bowl Concert comes to you direct from the famous Hollywood Bowl. And it's a one-hour serenade under the stars that's the ideal formula for cool evening relaxation. And the Telephone Hour, a favorite for many years, is a perfect example of what we call the magic of radio as it combines the greatest musical talents in the world into a superb evening program for you. The most talented artists from the opera or concert stage appear each Monday on the telephone hour, and it's a musical highlight that is unequaled. So join NBC's Monday evening of music tomorrow for the Hollywood Bowl concert and the telephone hour. And for dramatic entertainment, don't forget Lux Radio Theater, returning to the air on Tuesday night, the day after tomorrow. You'll hear Merle Oberon in Wuthering Heights, so be on hand Tuesday for the premiere of Lux Radio Theater on NBC. Did you have fun at the country club, Gary? Yeah, swell. I got pretty pally with one of the police commissioners. A friend of Doc Gamble's. Oh? Mm -hmm. In fact, he told me how to get rid of this traffic ticket. Good. Mm -hmm. All I got to do is take it down to the city hall next Thursday to room 317. Yeah. And pay the fine. Ten bucks. Well... Good night. Good night, all. Fibber McGee and Molly is an NBC Radio Network production transcribed. With Arthur Q. Bryan as Dr. Gamble, Jack Crucian as Mr. Wong, and Herb Ellis as the officer. This is John Wald saying that Mr. McGee has an excruciating story that he can hardly wait until tomorrow to tell you. But wait he must until the same time tomorrow night. Good night. Interestingly enough, during the time that uh, uh, the uh, Bibber, McGee, and Molly went to a quarter hour, uh, for at least one season, The Great Gildersleeve went to a quarter hour. We have a few of those shows of very, very poor quality, and I'll try to dra drag one or two of them up uh, for you to hear. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, Gildersleeve went back to a full 25-minute show uh, in 1955 and remained as a 25-minute uh, feature until 1958. Uh, no real information as to why NBC did that, but they did it. Alrighty, there you have that episode of Fibber, McGee, and Molly and their quarter-hour sh uh, daily show uh, from September 12th, 1954. I'm Wyatt Cox. Remember our webpage is classicradio.stream, classicradio.stream, Hope you will come by and uh, say hi. And if you like what we do, you can buy me a copy. That's always appreciated as well. I'm Wyatt Cox, and you've been listening to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Have yourself a great day, won't you please?